if you've had a spinal injury or a serious injury, you might have been in rehabilitation in Dunleary or someplace like that for three to six months after your horrible injury. And the last place you want to go is another hospital, another clinic. You can come into a, a community gym environment, get in your training machine, it happens to be an exoskeleton, and walk. It makes it way better as well, you know. There was a feeling that if you had robotics, they had to be in a hospital, in a clinical setting, operated by professionally trained physiotherapists. For many people who live with a disability or a motor impairment um, and who aren't able to walk or stand up independently in their everyday lives, these individuals aren't sick. But sometimes these devices is to stand and walk for exercise and exercising alongside everybody else in your community uh, promotes that message of wellness. I quickly became aware that what we really needed to do was try and establish centres that were based in the community close to where people lived. We were all in hospital for too long. You're in a proper gym, you're not in a hospital gym. People feel more normal, they feel it's very inclusive inside in the gym where everyone's involved because there's normal people lifting heavy weights, squatting and deadlifting, all sorts of crazy stuff, but everyone's involved. People with disability are right side by side, they feel the same as everyone else and it's a very inclusive environment, a very empowering environment for all involved. How I uh, ended up in a wheelchair was from an accident many years ago, 1980, playing rugby down here in Scaries. I had a car crash on 2000, as I said, November 2019. I um, suffered a spinal injury um, in 1999. Um, through a rugby injury. I was in a road traffic accident. Um, I was a passenger in a car. Well, I just got to get a very bit pain in my tie, out of the blue, for what reason, I don't know. And I just went down uh, then. I fell from the tree and broke my neck. Nathan, he was our first spinal patient to come into the gym. He had to be dropped by his mother. He was able to make it here maybe twice a week and she just had to turn him in his sleep every hour, every night. I think one of the first things we did was boxing and he just put on the boxing gloves onto my hands and we just went boxing for about, and probably f it felt like three hours, but it might have just been 20 minutes or so, just on and off. And um, it, we kind of clicked and I was like, I think this guy gets it. I first met Nathan when we were doing a road show around Ireland. I've been involved for the past number of years in the introduction of robotic rehabilitation aids for people with spinal cord injuries and stroke. Uh, we'd been in Cork, but he'd missed the walking episode there. And he followed us all the way up to Galway, where for the first time in many years, he successfully walked in a robot. And he came into me one day and said, look, I walked, I think it was like something like 12 steps over the weekend in this thing called an exoskeleton. And I said, I said, like, can this help you? Like, and he said, I think I could. And I said, well, let's investigate it. And a short time later, I got a call from Nathan to say that he had found a gym that was willing to take the exoskeleton and he had a team put together that was going to fundraise the funds to do it. I was blown away. I was also just a little bit sceptical. Um, she came down to the gym, saw the work we did. And I looked around me. Where was the wheelchair ramp? Where was the hoist? Where were all these things that I was used to seeing? And I thought, how on earth are we going to fit an exoskeleton in here? But I've always, when I've wanted to do something, I've, I've put my heart and soul into it. I've, I've driven into it. I've, I don't normal, the word normal and average are words, I just, just, I hate them. So we were able to get the exoskeleton for one year and we had to pay a small sum up front to have it for a year and that allowed us one year to get the rest of the money to actually buy it. The fact that we had it and could show people what we were doing helped us to fundraise for it. Locally, there was a bit of a pushback because it was felt this should be in the hospital first rather than in the gym. And the manufacturers decided that maybe it should only be in a clinical place. 
that it could only be operated by physiotherapists. So we did a lot of work getting together, meeting local physiotherapists. Um, a local physiotherapist came and worked in the gym. We gradually overcame all the reservations of both the manufacturers and the clinicians. And we managed to get enough money together to get the exoskeleton, the first one in an open gym environment in the world. So, But that's not really why we did it. We did it because it just made sense. And, um, and there were people like me who could use it and, and not be in kind of a rehabilitation type centre or hospital environment, just, just like everybody else in their ski machine or their rowing machine or their treadmill. If you're in a wheelchair, you can use this just like another device to supplement everything else you do. We work very, very closely with EXO, the manufacturer, and uh, Barry Richards, Sandy Lapping, Dennis DeVate, all provided absolutely essential training support for us. Stand up. Should we further forward? No, he, well, when you push now, it will bend forward. Okay. I have a chair. Move forward. Move forward. Very good. Go ahead and close the feet. Are you feeling? Dizzy? So the training for the exoskeleton would have comprised of, I think it was th two three day blocks, pretty intense you know, because there's, there's lots of moving parts in this machine and you need to know how to input the data, you need to know what the, how do you make the adjustments to leg swing, the amount of time the person's standing on one leg, the, the, the rate of change and how the machine kicks in when a person's weight shifting from side to side because all those parameters are changeable on the machine. So there's a massive amount of stuff that you, our body is doing automatically that they've reproduced in the machine in massive detail and then you're trying to segment that. They'd come up with suggestions like, oh, do you know anyone with multiple cirrhosis? So I would ring around, find someone with multiple cirrhosis, invite them over for a free walk, they'd do it, stroke survivors and so on. And we got a couple of other um, spinal injury people as well. So literally we brought people in, learned how to assess them and walk them. Before a person is fitted on the exoskeleton, they have to go through a number of safety steps. So the first one is they're passed medically by their doctor or their consultant, usually and their consultant. The second round of checks that we have to do, that their, their weight is correct, their height is correct, that their tone history of a spasm and so on is okay, and they're used to standing, because if they're not used to standing, then their bone density might be compromised. Then they come in and I verify all that house stuff in-house. We, we fit them on the device. And then the day Patrick was measuring me up, they um, said, okay, um, you can use the Esco skeleton. They um, set it up and put me into it, and you're wondering what's going to happen. Am I going to just fall flat? Um, and when you stand then, you stand up and you're right up, and you're kind of looking at everyone in the eye. Um, the whole gym is just different. You see people just looking around the gym and noticing things differently because they've been at a certain height for so long, and they, you know, was that poster always there? Or, you know, I, I slag a few guys for being really tall, like, you know, and lanky and stuff, because they're looking down at me, and, but they're delighted to be up there and see the world from where they used to see it, you know. And um, I stood up and took my um, first few steps in, what was that, 20 something years. It was fantastic. Yeah, good fantastic. As I'd be walking along uh, on, the, on the exoskeleton, Colm would be behind me holding the strap at the back and I thought I was exerting all the, the, the energy uh, to, to keep for up and to do all these steps. Uh, Colm's a big, strong man, a very fit and strong man. Uh, so he was, all his energy was, was being used to keep me standing up in a position. He'd try and assist me to stand back, but he was holding me back in order that I could take the steps. And by the end of our, our journey at times, the sweat would be rolling off him. So um, if I got a workout, he certainly got, got a workout. When I got lifted up uh, there, like, I kind of came against him there because I was afraid that I would fall out uh, and things like that. And uh, uh, um, he said that he wasn't going to let me fall, that there was no way I could fall. It was impossible for me to fall uh, there. 
uh, because he was in charge of the the control and in charge of my body. Like uh, the crashed me home at twelve. I said, I haven't felt this way since the day I collapsed. Uh, in, a, uh, in that, I had a standing frame, but just seeing your feet moving and just going through the walking motion was great, and it was something that I felt was necessary to get the best result and um, best recovery possible and just to keep the body um, in good in good health. Now Nathan lives by himself, has his own car, drives, goes on holidays, works full time, has a, has the best independent life, best quality life we could give him, but considerably different considering his injuries. First year was torture because I had taken a 15, 16 year um, break. Um, so yeah, once you got back into it, it was brilliant. In the beginning, he uh, he had to help me all the ways in it. I just couldn't kind of really manage it, uh, that. Uh, that uh, and I was kind of thinking to myself, like, you know, that I just walked like that. I couldn't you know, sort of thing. But I said, <laughs> it wasn't going to get the better of me. I never said that to Colin. But <laughs> we got it in 2015, so we're nearly 10 years at it, so, you know, there's been a lot of people use it, so that's, that's great. So I definitely have seen a lot of benefits in my, in my, my legs. My, my legs have looked like they've got a lot stronger. Um, my upper body has got a lot stronger. My shoulders and things have got stronger. Transfers are getting better. Pushing is getting better. Balance is getting better. Um, as I said, like, it's a good environment down there. Um, you're involved with other people. Gets you out of the house, but more importantly, like it's great for your head. We like to sum up the physical benefits in the six B's, as we call them. There's benefit for bowel management, bladder health, bone density, breathing, blood circulation, and for the brain, the brain activity and mood in general. When we move within an exoskeleton device over and above just being upright or verticalization, as we call it, um, then studies have shown that the aerobic effect of walking in these devices is equivalent to moderate aerobic exercise. Thank you. Okay, you right leg first. Oh. Robots do sometimes, they get tired and break down. What happens to the people who want to go for a walk that day? It's been fixed twi twice in the last six months, prior to that maybe three years before I needed anything, you know. Our machine is at the end of life, so that's the reason why our machine is, uh, was away lately getting fixed. If anything was ever to happen to this thing, and from the way I look at it, a complete disaster and nightmare for me, like, uh, that, because I depend on that. I depend on that so much, like, I depend on that more than I depend on anything else, like, that. I don't know what I do, I suppose I just, Obviously, my heart, I suppose my heart would be broken a bit, really, because I wouldn't be able to go walking every week. In terms of where we are, we have to look at the current exoskeletons as those days when we got the first mobile phones, those big, clunky mobile phones. The batteries are heavy, they're rigid devices that are worn over clothing, and to move them around is quite a considerable amount of effort. Where the future really lies is making these devices more responsive to the user's intent and the movement that they intended themselves. So for example in our motion analysis laboratory here in UCD we have a number of studies looking at exoskeleton devices and looking at brain activity measured uh, by the electrical activity on the surface of the brain and looking at the electrical activity of muscles during these movements and trying to really meaningfully interpret and predict what these uh, signals are telling us so that in the future they could be entrained back into an intelligent robot that would understand what it is you want to do and how you want to do it and perform the activity that you require. Um, I don't see it as a job, it's, it's obviously a passion of mine. I don't work here, I just I practically live here because I'm here all the time but I do it because I love doing it. I love making a difference in people's lives and you know I'm, I'm a problem solver by nature so if I'm not getting you right you know I'm figuring out in my head the whole way how I can get you better. Yeah Colin is fairly he's pretty amazing I suppose in one way uh, yeah he likes to drive you on 
I suppose he only wants kind of what's the best for you and he wants you to reach your full potential of fitness that you can get to that he sees. So yeah, a lot of this is down to him and yeah, I can't really thank him enough really. When, when, when you start training, it's not nice, but Colin is there, he pushes you, um, but he also encourages you. He knows, he knows what we're able to do and he pushes us, but I think that's what we're there for. Colin is, is one of those guys that don't take no for an, uh, the, 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 an answer. If it's there and he knows it, you know, he brings the confidence out in himself for to be able to do it. And believe me, it is, he will bring it out to you. Yeah. Well, we have a never give up pattern here that we can always make you better. And I believe that 1% better is way better than 0% better. And we'll never give up trying to help people. Thank you.